you so much. Can everyone hear me? Can everyone hear me clearly? Okay, good, good. Well, it is such an honor to be here in this beautiful city to speak to you today. Thank you to all of the conference organizers for being such tremendous hosts. Let's give them a round of applause, shouldn't we? They've been wonderful. So hi, I'm Whitney Hess. I am a user experience designer, I'm an independent consultant. I work with a variety of startups, large enterprise companies, and I'm also a writer. I write on my own blog called Pleasure and Pain, and I write for other publications as well. And if you want to tweet at me, it's just Whitney Hess, my full name. So this is going to be a slightly different talk than I typically give. Um, it's pretty personal. My story starts here in New York City, where I was born and raised. Spent my entire life there, with the exception of university. Now, to give you some perspective, Florence has about 400,000 residents over about 100 square kilometers. Well, New York City has eight times as much land, but 20 times as many people. So you can imagine um, every one of them has something to say, but it can be very difficult to be heard with that many people. I was raised by two people who made it additionally difficult to get a word in edgewise. These are my parents. Um, they were the best teachers I ever could have hoped for because they made me raise my voice. In elementary school, every report card that I had said that I talked too much and that I was too opinionated, too pushy. But I saw injustice everywhere. I was surrounded by technology from a very young age, and while I loved using it, I didn't understand why it was so hard to figure out. I think it was the blinking 12 o'clock on the VCR that made me want to become a user experience designer. I mean, why do you need an instruction manual to figure out how to set the time? It doesn't make any sense. I was eager to get to work. Now, to me, user experience is the insistence of conscience in the design of technology. I think that's what it means to be a user experience designer, what it really comes down to designing with good conscience in an effort to treat people better. And that's what I want to be my responsibility, to treat people better. At the very core, user experience is about standing up for what's right and seeing to it that it's done. Now, there's conscience and then there's consequence. I'm not sure if it's by accident that these words look so similar. When you act on conscience, you go against the status quo. And as a result, um, the res you know, things may go well and things may not go so well. Typically, the results can be greater than you ever imagined. Sometimes they hurt like hell. Nietzsche said that it's easier to cope with a bad conscience than with a bad reputation. I don't agree. I don't agree with this one bit. When I look in the mirror, what I see, that's the most important thing to me. And so I speak my mind. I've devoted my career to speaking my mind and to doing what I believe is right. I want to share a few milestones in my career so far that have been the result of speaking my mind. Most have been positive. I'm happy to say most have been positive, but a few have been negative, but I value them all equally. The first example of when I spoke my mind and how it impacted my career was on my very first project and my very first full-time job. I was given an assignment to design an experience for American Express. They were the client. And we needed to allow users to find the credit card that best meets their needs. Except we had no idea what those needs were. 
the creative director on the project wanted me to just figure it out, just do whatever I thought was best, make my best guess. But I didn't think that my best guess was good enough. And so I wrote a proposal for conducting user research. It wasn't a part of the project plan. The client accepted the additional time and expense, and this is what we ended up with. Um, it is essentially a dynamic display of credit cards that filters by what features the user chooses. And because of the work that I did, I was invited to present the prototype to the CEO of American Express. He thought it was so innovative that he decided to patent it, which was pretty overwhelming and unexpected. And there I am in the middle of the list on the left, named as one of the inventors. Now, it's pretty insane to me to see this and to know that this is the result of the first professional project that I worked on. And there was an incredible team of people working on it. I cannot take the credit for this. But I know that I'm the one who insisted that we do the user research. And I know that it was because of that user research that we were able to find the insights that led to this design. When I spoke my mind to encourage advocacy, two and a half years ago, I had never given a presentation in front of an audience. I'd never stood on a stage with the exception of my college graduation. Um, the idea of being here in Florence in front of you today would blow my mind if you told me that in two and a half years I would be here right now. I was a total introvert, believe it or not, for those of you who may know me, you don't believe it, but I realized that it was hurting my career. I realized that I needed to come out of my shell, and so I started blogging, and I started Twittering, and spreading the word about user experience, and I felt that our little community was spending a little too much time talking to each other and not enough time talking to others, and so I wanted to encourage people to get out of their shells as well. So I submitted a talk to the 2009 IA Summit. Um, it was called Evangelizing Yourself. You can't change the world if no one knows your name. When it was accepted um, and I realized that I was going to have to actually do this, I was sick to my stomach. I spent three months in a total panic creating the presentation. And when I got on stage, my knees were shaking. I felt like I was going to throw up. It was a horrible experience when it first started. Well, it paid off. I overcame my fear and spoke my mind, said what I needed to say, and um, it happened to really reach people. I wasn't expecting it to have the reach that it did, but on SlideShare, you can see that it now has almost 30,000 views, which is pretty incredible. I continue to get emails about it. People tell me that it had an impact on their lives in ways that I never would have imagined. And it was only because I felt that I had something to say and I chose to say, say it that really made that happen. And it just feels so good. A year later, I was asked to give the closing plenary at the same conference, which I had only given my first presentation at a year earlier. Now, I'm not that experienced. I'm probably a lot less experienced than many of you in this room. And I'm not an expert speaker, but I was willing to speak my mind. And they knew that what I came onto the stage to say would be how I really felt and that that would have an impact. So amazing things happen when you overcome your fears and speak your mind. But they're not always positive. When I spoke my mind to confront bias, um, it was because I had, had very high expectations of people. I had very high expectations of myself, so I think it makes sense that I expect the most from other people as well. And when I see someone who's highly respected behaving in a way that I think is inappropriate or um, detrimental to our community, I can't help but say something. So in 2009, I was at South by Southwest for the first time. It was the last day, the last panel. And I went to see a panel called From Blog to Book Deal, all about how people have taken their blogs and turned them into books. And three people were on the panel who I really respected and knew from afar. Hugh McLeod, who's a cartoonist. Guy Kawasaki, 
who it was an Apple evangelist for many years and is known as an entrepreneur and an author. And Stephanie Klein, who was a life blogger in New York City for many years, who basically was a dating blogger, who I had read five years prior. Now, I was sitting in the first row, and I felt very uncomfortable about the things that Guy Kawasaki was doing. He kept cutting off the women panelists. There were two other women on the panel that are not pictured. He was putting them down. He was interrupting them. He was um, discounting everything that they were saying. And as he was doing it over the course of the hour, I was getting more and more annoyed. And I was live tweeting the panel. And so um, I sent one fateful tweet. Wow, Guy Kawasaki is being a total dick. Is he always like this? Well, it was easy to send because I was just looking at my laptop. But what happened next, I never could have predicted. Um, Guy Kawasaki was looking at his iPhone during the panel. <laughs> and he saw the tweet. And someone else was speaking, and he interrupted them. And he looks out into the audience, and he says, who is Whitney Hess, and how am I being a dick? I didn't even have time to think. So I just shot my hand in the air and said, I am. Uh, something else took over me. Well, he put me on the spot, and I wouldn't back down. I told him exactly what I thought. I told him that I thought that he was being unfair to the other panelists. Um, and he didn't seem to see a problem in this, but I did, and we had a quick exchange, and then the moderator of the panel said, okay, let's move on, and that was that. It was embarrassing, to say the least. I'm sure I was red in the face, but I went on live tweeting the panel. Well, the whole exchange was recounted in detail in a book called The Back Channel by Cliff Atkinson. Came out a year later, and the author contacted me for a statement before it was published, so at least I knew that it was happening. But I wasn't thrilled about it. Um, I figured it was better to explain myself than not say anything at all, and I knew that he'd be talking to Guy Kawasaki, so I thought, okay, I'll talk to him. Um, so I talked to him. But imagine my reaction when I discovered it was chapter one, page one. I opened the book. There's my name a whole bunch of times. It was definitely not my proudest moment. Do I wish that it had happened differently? Yes. Do I wish that it wasn't immortalized in a book? Of course. But after the panel ended, I was putting away my laptop. I was packing up my bag. I was looking down. And when I looked up, there were a line of women waiting to talk to me. Just to say thank you. Just to say, I was thinking the same thing, but I would have never said anything. Or I was wondering if anyone else felt like he was being kind of unfair. So whatever embarrassment I had to deal with, um, whomever I pissed off for being obnoxious or talking out of turn, I'm OK with that. It was so valuable for me just to have that experience. When I spoke my mind to clarify purpose, um, a large part of how I spend my time is educating people about user experience. Given that I'm a consultant, I um, do it every day with my clients. I speak at conferences like this. As I said before, I write on my blog. I write for other publications. And my goal is to encourage companies to design with purpose and to really identify what problems they're trying to solve before they solve them and to employ user experience methods in an attempt to facilitate the process. One of the articles that I wrote on this topic, I thought said a lot of the same things that I typically say. Um, but sometimes things I say cause controversy unexpectedly. I can't predict when and why it's going to happen. Um, it's usually a surprise to me. I use straightforward language and harshness in a lot of my writing, and I didn't feel that this was any different. But once in a while, there are people who get very angry at me, and this is one of those examples. So this was a post for 52 Weeks of UX. It's a blog um, by Josh Porter. And um, 
the vast, I said essentially in the post, the vast majority of startups aren't employing user experience practices. Um, they don't have a user-centered design process and therefore don't really create products that actually matter to people most of the time. That was what I had to say. Well, um, it caused quite a stir. One person wrote a retort on their blog titled Losing Faith in UX, um, in which the person said that my post is terrifying, that I display incredible ignorance and naivete based on limited experience, um, and that because of that, he was losing faith in the field of user experience. Well, that was certainly opposite of what my goal was, so that definitely came as a surprise. It got a little worse in the blog comments. Um, someone wrote, wrote quite a lengthy comment, this is only a piece of it, um, calling me very inexperienced, narcissistic, has the power of older members in her community to carry her and defend her. That hurt when I feel like I've uh, definitely worked hard to be where I am. He also said, there's a problem with young little girls being mentored by experts in the field and enjoying the benefits of stardom. So he was really taking a personal dig at me and at people like me. There's another piece that I wrote recently called, You're Not a User Experience Designer If. Um, it was an attempt to combat a trend that I'm seeing where people are calling themselves user experience designers but not actually doing user experience work in what I define it as. Because user experience, as I'm sure we all know, is becoming a very popular buzzword. And so I wanted to write a post to try to curb what I see is happening. Well, to my surprise, this post became the most traffic blog post I've ever written. Um, I got a lot of positive feedback, both in the comments, people emailing me. You know, one person said that they were going to print it out to their boss to give it to them. Another person said they were going to give it to all the junior UX designers on their team to be something, you know, to um, aspire to. Now, that made me feel amazing, but other people said, you know, don't read this. Um, you know, this is something written by a threatened consultant seeking to differentiate themselves from the body of a growing market. Maybe that's true. I don't know. Um, but I respected the people who said negative things on my blog because at least it started a conversation. I was able to respond. Other people were able to respond. The point of me speaking and wanting to generate conversation is so that I can learn, so we all can learn from each other. And so I really was glad that the conversation was happening there. But then, of course, there are the people that didn't feel like they could talk to me personally. Um, not everyone's so mature. This is a tweet. Doesn't matter who it's from. I don't know the person. I came across it a couple weeks ago. Um, seeing this done to your face is a little disconcerting, to say the least. Um, I mean, I advocate for treating people better. I don't really see it as being that controversial, but to some people, you know, it doesn't really work for them. That's okay. I make too much noise. Um, but I've had it way worse than this. I've had, you know, that's just the price for being outspoken and it's not even important to go into the details. But will these people ever get me to shut up? Hell no. Because it reaffirms that a conversation needs to be had. It reaffirms that what I'm saying matters to people. And I really believe that those of us who keep it inside and don't share our views aren't really furthering the community as a whole. And lastly, when I spoke my mind to demand better, being a user experience designer can be a blessing and a curse. There, I've basically, you know, been trained and trained myself over the years to identify problems and to propose solutions. And the more I do that, the more I work for clients, the more I see problems all around me. I'm sure many of you experience the same thing. And so this makes me a very unpleasant customer. I often complain about poor user experiences on my blog, and one company that I write about the most um, is called Seamless Web. They allow you to order food for delivery online, 
And I've been a customer of theirs for three years. And the service is awesome, but it's very difficult to use. So I've blogged and I've tweeted about them. And um, I started up again in February because other friends of mine were saying negative things about the experience and I joined in. And then after midnight, I got a response from someone who I didn't know. So I clicked through to his bio and I saw that he was the president of Seamless Web. So uh, we talked about that night. He invited me in for a meeting and the rest is history. I just finished a two month engagement with them, helping them to do user ex uh, experience research and strategy for all of their products and um, have brought the process of user centered design into their company and it's been a fantastic opportunity. So reflecting back on these moments, these pivotal moments in my career that were caused by speaking my mind, I've come to realize that I'm not just working as a user experience designer, but I'm living as one as well. Don't just fill a role. Stand up for what you believe in. Share yourself fully and without fear. Speak your mind. Show your conscience. Grazie. Thank you for listening.